they're ahead, but the good thing is we've still got the internet, we've still got the alternative media, and there's a lot more of us than there is of them. A lot more. Look, 80% of Americans share our values. They may vote Democrat for handouts, but they share our values. They're patriotic people. They're uninformed, but they share our values. They're not the enemies of this country. The enemies of this country are probably 5%. But, you know, but they're like the, they're like the mafia in Sicily, the 2 or 3%, but they can control a whole country through corruption and crime and thuggery and whatever. Fear. And that's how they'll do it here if they're given the chance. Yes, sir. In 2005, President Bush uh, signed something called the Security and Prosperity Partnership in conjunction with Paul Martin of Canada and Lopez Portillo of Mexico. Do you see any nexus whatsoever between that and the supposed North American Union that that was supposed to tee up and efforts by communists and the DSA? Yeah, well, it's sort of funny because sometimes the DSA will oppose that. So, look, that's more of a, to me, that's more of a Fabian thing, you know. It's the Council on Foreign Relations and all those sort of organisations which are Fabian influenced want to break down borders. They hate the idea that sovereign countries exist because you can't influence and control sovereign countries who have a strong military and a strong willingness to defend themselves. So, look, I'm, I believe in free trade. I believe in free enterprise, but I don't believe in government-enforced treaties and, and breaking down borders and destroying national sovereignty. And that is why, you know, elements in the Republicans are just as dangerous as, as some of the elements in the Democrats. They just do things at a higher level. So this is not Democrats versus Republicans. This is the US middle class and patriots against the, the Democrats, which are basically all communists now, and large elements within the GOP. You know, and there's a lot of good, good people in the GOP, I think. Ann Coulter had it right. She said, now there are, no, there, are, there are plenty of bad Republicans, but there are no good Democrats. You know, that's the reality. The Democrat Party that used to have a lot of good conservatives, like Larry MacDonald out of Georgia, who was a fine conservative, is now a socialist party. And the, and the Republican Party is being slowly retaken over by the grassroots. And the real Republicans are coming through, and the country club Republicans and the old progressive Republicans are on their last days. And if we can carry that, carry that going, the Republican Party can return to its real roots. Uh, question for you regarding the, uh, you've brought up a lot of Soviet era. Um, I happen to have been in the military, got in the military in 90, just so before the fall of the evil empire. But, uh, you know, my full understanding was the Communist Chinese Party uh, and the Communist Russian Party were diametrically opposed on a lot of their viewpoints. Yet now the communist threat seems to be coming more almost from China than it does from Russia. Though there is obviously some interesting things occurring over in Russia right now uh, with Putin. Uh, what... You know, it sounds more like you, you, we, the, we're dealing more with Russian-based communism versus Chinese-based communism. Well, that is the common view. <clears throat> and that is the reason why Nixon opened up to China in the 70s, because he believed that he could use the Chinese against the Russians. Now, I hold a very different view, and some of this will be very controversial, there's a famous defector in the 1960s called a Natalie Galitsyn. Top KGB man, defected out of Finland, um, but was picked up by the British and was really adopted by James Jesus Angleton, the head of your CIA counterintelligence. His view was that in 1958, the Soviets and the Chinese, they held a big conference of worldwide communist parties, which they did, that's public knowledge, and there they developed what they called the long-range strategy. And they, would, they staged what they called the fake Soviet-Chinese Sino-Soviet split of 1961 and a whole lot of other disinformation exercises. 
Now, this sounds all far-fetched, unbelievable, but Gallitzin wrote his book in 1984, and he said at that time the Berlin Wall would come down, that communism would retreat in Russia, that East, and East Germany would give up communism, and that would lead to openings to the West and it would allay the West's fears, but communism would be maintained in China, even though there would be capitalist elements, and when the West was sufficiently weakened, the Chinese, the Russians, and all their allies would rejoin together with what they called one closed fist and would strike at your country. Now, that all sounds very far-fetched, but China, and whether you believe that old background or not, Russia and China and Iran and all the Uzbekistans are today allied in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization which is effectively a military, political, economic alliance. It is far stronger than the old Warsaw Pact ever was. And those people are working with the Cubans and the Venezuelans and the Bolivians and the Nicaraguans and the South Africans and a lot of other people around the world basically to marginalise and destroy your country. So whether you believe it was a long-term plan or not, they are working together now. Russia and China are allies today. This, this split stuff, you Google the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, they hold joint military exercises together, they are allies. And they are, Iran is their ally, and so are Nicaragua, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba, and all these countries. So although people don't know about it, it's, you're facing a bigger and more organised block against you than you ever, ever have. And your President and your Secretary of Defence thinks now is the time to downgrade your military to fight a one-front war. There was a gap... But please, but please Google Shanghai Cooperation Organisation and Google Natalie Galitzin's New Lies for Old. Um, there's a lot of stuff about him and if you, even if you don't believe the Natalie Galitzin stuff, the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation is real, it has a website, and there's lots of information on it, and it exists today, and your mainstream media won't even mention it. Can you tell about what you think we need to do as Americans um, to make a change? I mean, what can we do? Where's, where... Well, it's, you're doing what you're doing, you're doing it now, you know. Look, there's two immediate things in front of there's two there's, there's short term, long term. The short term thing is this government must be changed this election. It has to happen because you have a communist government in power. And if they get another term without any, without any, without any constraints, they will come after you guys. They will come after all, your opposi all their opposition so they never have to face another election again. So that's essential. You've got to keep the House, take the Senate, and please, please take the White House. Because even if you get Romney in there, who I'm not particularly fussed on, if you can get 20 Jim DeMints in the Senate and 50 Alan West in the Congress, that will go a long way towards turning this country around. And you've got to keep the state houses and you've got to strengthen, get more conservatives in the state houses, because that will mean that your states can start giving the finger, I'll be very crude, to the federal government. You know, basically the, the states have got to be stronger, and you can do that at a local level. So long term you've got to strengthen the states, but you've also got to, this is a cultural battle, this is a spiritual battle. You know, ultimately that's what it is. This is good versus evil. So you've got to be working in your school boards, in your churches. All these church people. In the American Revolution, the churches stood up and were with the revolution. They led the charge. Today, a lot of church people, they're so scared of losing their 5013, whatever it is, non-profit status, they hide behind this thing. Oh no, we don't get involved in politics. If the churches do not see, with what's happened in recent weeks, that they are not due for persecution, they have got their head buried in the sand, and they've got to stand up. So you people, you've got to work at local level, your churches, your community groups, your school boards, your county commissions, fight Agenda 21, 
your state houses, your state legislatures, your Congress, your Senate, your White House, all the way up. So you've got an immediate thing in front of you and all those long-term goals, and you guys are doing it. You've done a huge amount in the state legislatures, the school boards. You're changing the culture. It's just a matter of can you do it fast enough? So you amp it up, do what you're doing, but do a little bit more of it. So I, I don't think you're doing anything wrong, just got to do more of it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Trevor, for, for what you just said. At the end of your regular talk, I, th I believe you referred to, um, maybe not in this word, but the miracle of the founding of this country uh, that was against all kinds of odds. And uh, it was the hard work of some dedicated people who put their life and their fortunes and their sacred honor all out there, mm. which is what it will take again. And there's a piece in the equation that we just referred to now, and that is the blessings of Almighty God. And I am with you entirely that the federal government has to be pushed back within the bounds of the Constitution. What I'm not talking about is trying to solve all of our moral and, and uh, those kind of problems at the federal level. It's at the local level. Yeah. State, more local than, yeah, state, county, but the most local is, is our community, our churches, our yeah. families, and our individuals. Because yeah. our founders told us that the best of our Constitution was ineffective for people that did not have the moral restraint within. Yeah, this, so, this, yeah, this country was designed for good people, wasn't yeah. it? And if, if, if you have a great government and bad people, you're just going <laughs> to... And I think a great deal of the work that we must do is, is to bring their conversations in our daily lives to these, to these kinds of issues not to single out people for judgment for this or that or the other thing, but just to say we need to accept responsibility on the local level as individuals and families to take care of what we have, of what we have defaulted to government responsibility. Yeah. We need to be able to show that we, we, can, we can assume those responsibilities and take care of them locally. Yeah, look, I 100% endorse that. That's, it's, it's from the ground up. It's from the individual up, isn't it? Individual has to make their own decisions on which side they're on here. Yeah. Look, you know, you're right. The social, the socialists love to so, so they create social problems and then they step in at a federal level to solve them. You know, don't let them do that. You solve your own issues locally. The federal government is there to defend your country and a few minor things and hold ceremonies and run a few embassies. That's what they're there for. And I'll draw an analogy too. Look, this is one I quite often bring up. A lot of people think, you know, you get the Republicans back and everything's sweet, you know, we can go back to sleep for another four years. Look, you've got a big problem in this country. It's grown and grown and grown. And I say it like this. If you have a huge trash pile in your backyard, you will get rats. That's guaranteed. And they will spread disease and they will create chaos. You can poison the rats and trap the rats. Every few months or every four years you can go out and you can poison the rats and trap the rats. But you go away and the rats will come back. The only way to get rid of the rats is to get rid of the trash pile. And your big trash pile in your country is the federal government. You've got so much trash in there. You've got organ, you know, the federal government shouldn't have a federal reserve. It shouldn't have an EPA. It shouldn't have a department of education. It shouldn't have a department of energy. You can't just modify these things and downsize them and run them more efficiently. They are a trash pile. They're holding your country back and they'll destroy your country if you leave them there. So they, this revolution has got to go through and gut the federal government and, as you said, restore it, put it back behind constitutional boundaries. And if you do that, you will save this country. If you do not do that, you're only delaying the inevitable. Hi. Uh, I just want to... Oh, God, that's loud. Sorry. Um, you know, I, I went to the caucuses for the first time ever. I walked out of there... Sorry? Went where, where? The caucuses. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, had never been before. I walked out of there a precinct committee person and a county and state delegate. Good for you. Well, you know, and but honestly, tonight, 
before I came here, some of the things I was thinking about was backing out of that because I didn't want to be a target. I didn't want to be um, marked, if you will, uh, that, that kind of thing. But i not certain that I had what it took to fight in that capacity or be involved in that capacity. And um, knowing that there are people like you out there that really support us um, around the world, um, it's kind of changed my mind. I, well, I, well, I don't know what I can do, but whatever I can do, I, I'm going to do it. Look, look, I've talked to you. I know you're intelligent. I know you're impassioned. You'd be a far better delegate than a lot of people out there. So stick with it because you will learn and you'll grow with that. You know, <laughs> the people who started the American Revolution, they, as the man said, they sacrificed their, they, they stood to lose their lives, their liberty and their sacred honour. You know, and that's, that's, that's the kind of concepts they thought about yeah, in those days. And I can see you've got, the, got it there to remind you of that. So I say, you're on the right track. The fate of your country stands in the balance and the fate of every free nation of the world stands in the balance. So yeah, you might get laughed at a bit, you might get called a racist, you might um, lose a bit of money, you might be marginalised and you might become a target. All those things could happen, but we're already targets. You know, if we lose, they're coming after us. I can guarantee you that. If you put your hand up, anybody who's in a Christian church, an evangelical Christian church, or a church that doesn't toe the line, anybody who's in business, anybody who's an independent thinker, anybody who's a Tea Party activist, Can they are going to get Can looked at. So you're already a target. The only way you're not going to be a target is if we win this. So once you're in, you've got to go forward. There's no turning back. Yeah. If I can do anything to help preserve our legacy, yeah. maybe that's why I have the time to do it. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and, and what, more, what more important battle is there in the world today than this? Can you, you, if you can name one, you tell me, and I'll go there. There is none. Okay, well, what are you going to do with your time? Your spare time. You know, it's, it's <laughs> pretty simple when you look at it, isn't it? And, and I, good on you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. What factual background do you have, if any, as to who's behind the Occupy Wall Street movement and its strategic purpose, and can we anticipate its activation or reactivation this spring? Very good question. Occupy was originally started by anarchists, but the communists very quickly got involved. And I'm talking about Communist Party USA, Workers' World Party, Democratic Socialists of America, um, Socialist Workers Party um, and International Socialist Organization. They basically run Occupy around the country now. So, and the union well, yeah, but okay, the union, but these organizations run the unions. That's what I'm saying. So they're working in together. So Occupy is coming back, but it's going to be not the scruffy, you know, horrible movement you've seen camping in parks so much. It's going to be occupying state houses at budget time, it's going to have big rallies on May Day, it's going to be working with the labour unions, it's going to be occupying schools, campaigning against student debt for the forgiveness of student debt, occupying homes due for foreclosure, etc, and occupying ports. Now there was a whole bunch of leaders of the Occupy movement, including several members of the Workers' World Party, which is pro-North Korean and Cuban, down in Mexico and Tijuana in December this last year, about December 12th, 13th. And I've got the videos of it, where they were talking openly about how they shut down the ports of Oakland last year, and how they're gonna shut down ports all across this country this year. So it, they're working, they were down there with Cuban, leading Cuban trade union officials, discussing how they were gonna amp up the Occupy movement the Occupy movement is 100% controlled by the far left and it's working in collusion with the Obama administration. This year they will create chaos in Chicago at the G8, I think it is, or the NATO summit. They'll also probably attack the Republican Party convention in Tampa. They'll be there to create chaos 
I don't know how far it will go. It depends on Obama's election fortunes, I suppose. But they're there as a diversion to intimidate Republicans, to intimidate Tea Party people. They're a black shirt army controlled by the communists. And there's no other way of putting it. Speaking of infiltration, um, do you have any comments or um, thoughts about Agenda 21 or ICLEI? Yeah. In my opinion, Agenda 21 is one of these things, you know, I talked about before about how the communists will set a policy, they'll give it to the local communists, and it will be implemented in the target country, and nobody will know it's a communist policy. In my opinion, and this is speculation to a degree, but there is some evidence for it, I think the bones of Agenda 21 were laid at Moscow University in the 1960s. And the idea of it, it is pushed by the left, even though you'll get Republicans stupidly signing off on it, they have no idea of the origins of it, but the idea is it's the beehive model. The old Plato used to talk about this. The ideal society was a beehive run by a king with armies, with worker bees, you know, soldier ants, with soldier bees or whatever, and a whole lot of drones. And they'll be in little hives and they would just, you know, get their food from around, around the area and it'd be a rigidly top-down controlled society. And what is communism but that? So what they want is, is cities where we all work in our little co-ops, we have our leadership, we have our army and our police force, and the surrounding land grows our mung beans and our vegetarian you know, food. We won't have any meat, because that's far too uh, labour intensive and land intensive. And the rest of the land will lie fallow. So the ideal society of Agenda 21 is a beehive society, a communist society where we're all in little enclaves surrounded by a bit, little bit of farmland and everything else is left to the wolves and bears and whatever. And so that's where Agenda 21 is taking us. That's where the whole thing is going. So when I see Tea Party people taking it on all over the country and getting it pushed back, I say hurrah, because it's great. And I see that happening in Florida and Nebraska and Oregon and whatever. This is a communist policy disguised under the term of sustainability and sustainable land use and whatever, but it's a policy. Look, America is all about people living in their own little towns, their own houses out in the country or wherever they want to live, with cars, with mobility, doing what they want to do when they want to do it. And the left hates that because they can't control it. They want you all in little locked-in communities where you have your assigned little task and you bike to your local co-op every morning for work, and that's their ideal society, and that's where Agenda 21 wants to take this country. So if you can fight back and re-establish the American way, that's great. I, I applaud you. Uh, could you describe to us what the Delphi technique is? If I knew what it was, um, oh. <laughs> I, would, is there I, anybody? Would, I would do so. I'm okay, sorry, I don't, I don't know of it. Okay. Um, does somebody, could somebody else describe what the Delphi technique is? Basically, it's my understanding that you present an idea, that you, you present whatever the issue is framed in however you want people to think about it. Oh, and this is what... And yeah, you yeah. only offer two alternatives, and both of them will lead you to what they want you to yeah, think. This is, this, is what, this is the basis of consensus. You know, this is what they do. They, they, the, the local government leadership sets a policy and they hold public hearings to reach a consensus. And it's all psychologically planned, so they'll get what they want anyway by using the technique. I've never heard it described as that, that's all. But it's, it's the psychology of consensus. And it's predetermined, and 99% of the time, they can manipulate people into giving them the outcome they want. So it's a huge farce and a sham, basically. And that's how a lot of the, the so-called local planning is done. And the, and, the, and the socialists get up and say, well, there was a consensus for this, so... Right. Can you describe the difference between socialism, communism, and Marxism? Well, Marxism is a theoretical basis. Socialism is theoretically the system where the government owns, owns or dominates 
the means of production, distribution, and exchange. So it's a matter of centralizing power. All power that socialists believe we started, Marxists believe we started out as primitive man. We lived in a communal communist society, right? Then a few people started getting powerful and they discovered farming, so they set up a feudal society where lords and, and um, barons ruled the communities around them. Then we discovered industry, that along came the Industrial Revolution, and we had capitalism. So that built up the wealth. So therefore the next step is to get that wealth, to put it all in government hands, because the capitalists are far too dangerous and out of control. You can centralise all that wealth into government hands, and then that leads to peace and prosperity for all, and eventually the government will wither away and you have a communal communist society. But it never gets past socialism because once you've got power centralised, nobody ever gives that up willingly. And I'll, I'll take uh, the general. I don't know if the gentleman's still here, but I'll talk about communist China today. A lot of people think China is a capitalist country because they have all this industry and far less regulation in some ways than you do. China openly acknowledges, if you read their publications, they went from feudalism straight to socialism. They missed out capitalism. And that was a big mistake. And they'd say, well, we made a big mistake. We were trying to go too fast. So now we've got to go back to capitalism to build up our strength so then we can go back to socialism and on to communism. And so the, the, the Chinese communists, have this, there's 80 million members of the Chinese Communist Party all imbued with the idea that they are going to come back at some stage to a more traditional socialist path. So this idea that we can rely on the Chinese to lead us to capitalism is a bit, bit naive and misguided because nobody reads their actual publications. This is just classic Marxism. Same as in Vietnam. Same as in Russia today. They went back to... They, they, they made a mistake by going too fast to socialism and communism, but they recognise the mistake. They go back to a bit of capitalism, build up their strength, and then they can go back on the path again. But there's a man over here. We, people must be getting a bit tired by now, but there's a man over here who's got a, another question. Uh, it was reported recently that Sweden has gone cashless. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that part of the master plan? I presume that's part of the master plan. Well, uh, it is, you know, that... <laughs> Because, well, the cashless. Idea, the idea is the ideal society for the communists was no. Look, back in back in, I'll tell you this. Back in Moscow, when my friend was training in Moscow in the 1980s, the Soviets openly said to all the students there that socialism, as it is enacted in the Soviet Union, does not work. They said it doesn't work because we have all these capitalist societies who have a wage system, and people get money, and that's stopping us, and, and, and that is stopping us implementing communism worldwide. They said, we have to, to, for communism to work, it must be worldwide, and we must abolish the wage system worldwide. No money. So part of that, you could say cashless society, is part of that, because if you haven't got cash, it's hard, it's, you're easy to control because you have to go through electronic means all the time to do your business. You can't just go down to the you know, local mechanic and give them a hundred bucks. You know, it's, 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 government hates cash. Government loves if, if POS and electronic transactions because they can monitor everything you do. So yes, indeed, although there are a lot of benefits for this technology, this will be used, if we allow it, will be used to control us in the future. You know, so it's, 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 Sweden is a socialist country, it's an experimental country. They will push this as far as they can, for sure. They also, as far as I understand, consider their children the uh, property of the state. Is that the case, or? Well, I, I don't know specifically about, well, it is to a degree. Like in Sweden, you cannot own land. All land is owned by the state, 100% of it. You can lease it, but there's no such thing as a private house, technically. All land is owned by the state. And uh, look, in Sweden pioneered the um, 
and the non-smacking of children. So you cannot smack your children. My country now has that. You cannot physically discipline your child in my country. And that was passed in our country on the Swedish example by a woman called Sue Bradford. Sue Bradford was a Green member of our parliament, a former member of the Maoist Workers' Communist League, who then went into the Green Party, and she got anti-smacking legislation passed in our, in our schools, in our, in our homes. I want to smack my little boy, he'll say to me, I'll tell the police on you, Daddy. Doesn't stop me, but I run the risk. <laughs> I run the risk. If you smack your kid in public, in my country, you can go to jail and lose your child. Okay? Now, so I, re I remember reading the, the Russian, the, the, so the Socialist Unity Party's publication in the 90s, and they talked then how they succeeded in getting corporal punishment banned in our schools. And they talked then how the next step was to get it banned in our homes. So that's an example of a communist pushing a policy through the Green Party that is now the law of my country. Same as the socialists did in Sweden. The Marxists pushed it through in Sweden. And you think what that does for parental discipline and school discipline in my country. You got your young 12-year-old daughter there, sir. And I bet she had the odd little tickle up when she was younger. And it's probably made her the, you know, the great kid she is today. And I don't, advocate, I don't advocate bashing kids or, or violence, but I do advocate strong parental discipline and strong scholastic discipline. And this is not aimed at protecting kids from abuse, as they say it is. It's aimed at weakening discipline in our society so that socialism can be more readily advanced. That's all it's about. So it's happened in my country, and I'll tell you what, 10 years ago, if you'd said in my country they were going to ban smacking of children in my country, they would have laughed at you. But now it's the law of the land. Can you talk about the universities, how things got going in the universities? Well, look, the left, you know, this, and as people have seen the gender will know that this has been going on for 100 years, this subversion of this country. And the universities were a er very early target, as were the journalism schools in this country. Like, there was a time when, when journalists used to be trained on the job. They would go and work for the local newspaper and cover the baseball games and the local state fairs and the drunk driving cases at court, and they would absorb the values of their community, and they were part of their community. After World War II, the left basically set up journalism schools in all the main universities. So now 90% of journalists are trained through university in the journalism schools, which are all run by the left. And they attract the left. They attract people who don't want to report the news, they want to make the news. And so you've got a situation where, where 80% of Americans have one set of values and those journalists have a whole different set of values. And the same with the universities. The universities were targeted very early with Marxist professors, many of them from overseas, and once they get hold of a department, they don't let go. And this is the key point to remember. If you're a conservative guy and you run a history department, you will hire a socialist if he's good. If he's a good teacher, you will hire a socialist or a liberal, you know, or an agnostic or whatever. You care about what he can do. If you're a socialist and you run a department, you will only hire other socialists because it's your duty to transform society and you don't want your charges indoctrinated by these evil conservatives. So that is how the left has taken over. While we care about our running our own families and our own lives, the left cares nothing but taking over your society so they get into positions of power and influence and once they're there, they don't let go and they only hire people who think like them. So we all know that, it's probably, you all know people, you know, good conservative folk, you know, who slave and work and do three or four jobs to put their young kid through college. And they go to college and they come back a flaming liberal. You know, we all know that happens. And why should, I'm a believer in academic freedom, but why should us as taxpayers fund the indoctrination of our children. So the universities have to be cleaned out, tenure has to be gotten rid of, 
and I would say getting the state out of the education system so it's only private universities who have to respond to their students. And the day I see half of American school kids leaving school to undergo an apprenticeship in motor mechanics or carpentry or whatever rather than go to university to be indoctrinated in women's studies or African American studies or whatever, I'll be very, very happy. Yes, sir? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts on, on the current presidential situation, the, the candidates? I mean, here we are uh, fighting amongst ourselves with the splatter campaigns. I, is there a chance that whoever's going to win between the top leaders right now, uh, is there a chance of either one of them actually beating Obama? And, and how do we get unified around that to make sure we do? Yeah, um, look, all they, they all have their good points. I have a personal favourite, and I'll tell you who he is, and I may offend whoever's here. I think the big issue for me, I think, is, is, is not just winning the election, it's what you do afterwards. And this is going to take a new American revolution. The first thing that has to go is Obamacare. It has to go. Because if you don't get rid of that, all else is lost. So who is going to abolish Obamacare? Out of the three, I think Rick Santorum would. I think Newt Gingrich would. Mitt Romney, I don't think so. I, you know, I may be wrong, but I think he's the least likely of the three to do so. I think this idea that he is the most electable is false because, look, Ronald Reagan was regarded as completely unelectable by the Republican Party hierarchy. They hated him. They wanted Gerald Ford or whatever, you know, they wanted some... But Ronald Reagan got in and he led the American people through what had to be done, through some very tough times. I think Newt Gingrich could do that, but I think he's got a lot of baggage and is not a fully reliable conservative. I think of the three that are there now leading, I think Rick Santorum is the one most likely to win and the most likely to do what is needed once he wins. So, yeah, look, Ron Paul is, secret, look, Ron Paul is secret, Secretary of the Treasury, I would applaud. His defence views, I do not. But his, his economic and constitutional views are superb. But So my view is, I think Romney is more likely to get it, but I'm praying for a miracle and I'm hoping Santorum gets it and gets some good people around him and takes this country back. That's what I'm hoping for. But other people may have different views. I'm not... I feel a bit uncomfortable trying... I, I'm here, happy to expose what's happening in this country, but when I get to picking your leaders, it's a bit different, you know? <laughs> Can you tell us about, um, you know, the farms, the agriculture industry is having... You know, they're saying that you can't even let your children um, help you on the yeah. farms. And, and they're taking the land. Oh, I know, and George Soros is purchasing large amounts of property. Oh, that's because he just wants a lot of landscaping, you know. Uh, look, look, who does the left hate more than independent farmers in this country? You know, independent people who live off the land, have common sense values, train their, you know, look after their kids, and are fiercely independent. You know, so the left will target and marginalise farmers and make life difficult for them because... They want the ideal thing. They want co-op farms. They want co-op farms surrounding their little villages, their, their, their beehives. They do not want independent farmers. So they will be targeted with rules and regulations. And, you, know, you know, you think about it. They want to drive people off the land. So if they can make it hard for farmers, what makes it harder? You know, we all know farmers have their kids out driving tractors and baling hay and doing stuff. That's what being a farm child is about, you know? And sure, occasionally one of them gets killed doing it. But, you know, that's... The thing is, independent farmers are a big backbone of freedom in this country. And if they can be marginalised and forced off the land, the government will do that, slowly but surely. And if George Soros is just fortunate enough to buy up a lot of land cheap, I'm sure he won't turn down the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah. Yeah, he needs to go. Uh, is there anybody else that you can target that we can kind of support? Well, in, in the Senate, I'll talk about the Senate. Obviously, I think Olympia Snow is standing down. But Lindsey Graham's another one. I'm saying Dick Luger to me is a dangerous. These other guys are just more weak or just leftist, you know. But, um, you know, Olympia Snow, Susan Collins, Lindsey Graham, Oren Hatch, I think. Um, you know, there's a few of them in the Senate, but you guys know who they are. But I was singled out Dick Luger because he's not just weak or wishy-washy. He's actually on the other side, in my opinion. So, Mr. Loudon, how about that Cass Sunstein, huh? Cass Sunstein, yeah, yeah. Well, his wife, Susan Powers, you know, she's involved with this responsibility to protect. That's all about... We heard Panetta talk about it the other day, that America doesn't have to... The government doesn't have to refer to Congress to, you know, get American troops in the field now. They just have to go to NATO or the United Nations. And that's all about... Susan... That Cass Sunstein's wife designed that responsibility to protect doctrine. It's basically, and it's going to be used against Israel, mark my words. It's the idea that America has a responsibility to protect oppressed peoples. Now, they did that in Libya to try it out so people would swallow it because Gaddafi was a pretty bad guy. But they're, they're gearing up to use it in, in um, Israel against Israel, because Israel is oppressing the Palestinians, and America is going to have to step in there with their troops to protect those Palestinians. So Cass Sunstein is a, is, a, is a radical leftist, as is his wife, but he's a clever, subtle, constitutionalist type of guy. He's eroding your constitution through slow and silent means. He's more of a Fabian. That's really what he is. So he's one of these guys that has, does not have this country's interest at heart and has to go out with Obama, as do all the czars and advisors around him. You were talking about <clears throat> Russia and China and, and Iran being together in a pack, and then Israel's right in the middle of that. What do you think? Sorry? And Israel is right in the middle? Yeah. And they're going to protect themselves, I believe. Well, think? well, look, Israel, you know, but this is the thing. We've always had this fiction that you've got these rogue states. We've got North Korea and Iran that do these crazy things. And we've got to get the Russians and the Chinese to help us to moderate these rogue states. It's total garbage. Iran would do nothing without Russian and Chinese blessing, just as North Korea would do nothing without Russian or Chinese blessing. Okay, it's a fiction that the State Department likes to maintain because they can, they can criticise Iran or they can criticise North Korea without having to confront Russia and China, who are actually the bosses. So, you know, Israel is sitting amongst this. And the other, the other little fiction here, we, we were all worried about Iran getting the nuclear bomb. Russia could give Iran a nuclear bomb tomorrow. We'd just ship it across the border in a, on the back of a jeep. So this is all a farce. Israel stands on the brink of destruction. The left wants to destroy Israel. Israel was once a Soviet client state. It was set up with the help of the Russians at the time, but it broke away. And the Soviets have never forgiven Israel for that. And Israel has a very strong left within the country trying to bring it down. So, you know, Israel has got a... <laughs> Obama is doing everything he can to stop Israel striking Iran because Obama wants to strike Iran when it suits him. And not in a big way, but in a little way. So, you know, there's no... The 80% of American Jews in this country who vote for Obama have got to realise that their parent country, the country they look up to, Israel, is on the verge of destruction and Barack Obama is doing more than anyone else to ensure that comes about. So, um, look, if Israel strikes at Iran tomorrow, I'm going to cheer them on. For all of the chaos that may ensue, their survival stands at stake. And we can't think that if we give up Israel, we're all going to be better off. Because if Israel goes, it's just going to embolden 
our enemies and they're just going to come faster at us. So that's my view of that situation. Will you discuss uh, your book and what's in it generally and your website? Okay, look, my book is called Barack Obama and the Enemies Within. It's about 700 pages of Obama's communist and socialist connections, who got him into power, their agenda, the people he's appointed, and where they want to lead this country. So I regard it as an encyclopedia on the subject. There's 111 chapters, so you can sort of, if you want to know about Valerie Jarrett, you look at the Valerie Jarrett chapter. You want to know about David Axelrod, you look at David Axelrod. You don't have to read the whole lot in one sitting. So I've never been challenged on point of fact. My information has been used by Glenn Beck and countless others. It was my information that led to the downfall of Van Jones, for instance, um, who was kicked out of the White House, um, thrown under the bus. So that's my book, and I urge you, there's about four copies left out there, so you can buy those if you wish. I have two websites. One is called trevorloudon.com or New Zeal, and that's my blog, and I expose a lot of this information on that on a daily basis. And the other one is KeyWiki, which is K E Y. W-I-K-I, -I, Key Wiki. Now that works like Wikipedia. It's an online encyclopedia of the US left. There's 61,000 profiles of leftists, leftist organizations, etc., from state senators and reps, labor union leaders, anarchist activists, communist activists, socialist activists, a whole bunch of your congressmen and senators, Obama himself, people like Jeffrey Sachs, George Soros, right from the bottom to the top, it's profiles of the leftist activists who are trying to bring your country down. So it's an encyclopedic resource, so please go and Google KeyWiki and look at it, and then Google your favourite, favorite, then type in the name of your favourite left-wing congressman, you know, Dennis Kucinich or Barbara Lee or Barney Frank or... Um, you know, Hillary Clinton or whatever, or George Soros or, you know, Jeffrey Sachs, whoever you don't like, have a look at them and I'm sure you'll find a page there somewhere. But, um, yeah, so you can get my, if you can't get a book tonight, you can get my book through Pacific Freedom Foundation. That's Pacific Freedom Foundation. Just go there and order a book online. But I order, you know, please do so because that's what pays my ear fears and uh, accommodation costs around this great country of yours. Yes, I want to mention that he is taking no money for the two hours that he will be speaking here. Yeah. It is only through the book that he will be getting any, hardly any compensation. This is his commitment, and I urge you all to spread this information and to check trevorloudon.com. Every day it is huge. So we have somebody who would like to talk about the chemical trails that are being put into the sky. Okay. Well, can I just, well, yeah, I'm getting a bit of a headache now. I need to stand down a minute. But look, I'd love to hear about this. But I, I really need to finish up the questions. I'm sure people need to get home to their families. Pretty sure, but please, um, you know. Actually, another time is fine. It's a whole oh, no, different no, no, subject. No, 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 I'll sit in the audience and watch. And listen, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. But I'm just going to sit down in the audience now, that's all. Oh, sorry, did you want to get my comment, did you? Well, basically what you can do is you can go to contrails.com, C-O-N. The Contrail. The Contrail. So that's C as in cat, O, N as in Nancy, trail.com, and find out what they're doing to what we're breathing and what the water, they're doing to the water and the soil. But have a, like, I didn't mean to dampen your thunder there, no, but no, no. just have... Say Actually, to... Mary just wanted me to bring it up because it's one of my pet peeves that I know a lot about. Sure. There's one other website that I'll mention, and I'm happy to give anybody my card if you want to know more, but carnicom.com, C-A-R-N as in Nancy, I-C-O-M, carnicom.com or carnicominstitute.org are... Uh, some of, the, some of the best places to get that. But there is a, a genocidal um, agenda going on having to do with what they're spraying in the air, and it goes much, 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 much deeper, but it's yeah. not attached to tonight, so. 
Well, but socialists don't like people. That's the bottom line. And you, you people are people, so you've got some enemies out there. And um, they don't like the idea that they think socialism is all about overturning the, nat the, the, the natural hierarchies. You know, parent, child, pupil, teacher, boss, worker, you know, government, people. They will try, these are the natural hierarchies that have established our free societies and stabilise and keep our societies going. So you look at what socialists are doing everywhere it is trying to overturn the hierarchies. And the biggest hierarchy is, well, in some ways, you know, well, man versus nature, you know. Man is different from nature. We have been given certain differences by our creator that make us different from nature. We are here to hold dominion over nature. And they are trying to overturn that so that we are just part of nature for a start and then we'll be under nature. So that's really what this is about. So anything that can attack people's health, their integrity, their independence, all of these things, their minds, their ability to reason and think, all of these things are under attack from some angle or another. So, but we have the advantage because we have the power of reason that was given to us and we have all these things and we have our fellow people that can join together and fight this back. We have just got to decide to do it and get stuck in. So we can win this. We can win it on every front and we can do some great things but we just have to understand that we have a responsibility by nature of by virtue of our nature we're not animals we're not we are we've, we're, we're here for a reason and we have got a responsibility to fight for individual liberty and individual freedom as long as that is granted to us and it's never going to be taken you know it can be taken away by other powers but never by the state and we've got to fight the state and the socialists at every opportunity until we restore the natural hierarchies that keep this planet functioning properly. So, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. There's lots of different things against us, but we can win. You know, we weren't put on this planet to go under. There's another DVD that's excellent on economics, and it's called God Onomics. So if you okay. Google that, you can find that because it's biblically ba based about how basically productivity works and how money works and how your right to the fruit of your labors is very clear in the Bible. Yeah. So I just mention that because it's very well done. Yeah, well, and it's a good point. There is this, there's, a, there's a reason why America was founded... You know, America didn't come out of an Islamic culture or a Hindu culture or anything like that. There's a reason why America is different. And so, you know, economic system has a basis. It isn't, <clears throat> it isn't, it isn't, it isn't an accident of nature. So we need to acknowledge that, that where it comes from and our responsibility to preserve it. You know, we're not animals drifting aimlessly. We are human beings with a purpose in life. And economics is how we sustain ourselves. And we were given the tools to sustain ourselves to achieve a purpose. But I, I've got to say, I am getting a little bit of a headache now. And I'm sure you all are too. But uh, thanks very much for having thank, me here today. Thank you very, very thank much, you. Trevor Loudon.